Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today in our video, we continue our study of the Old Testament by delving into the book of Ecclesiastes, also known as the Preacher. Ecclesiastes is an incredibly fascinating and immensely useful book, not only for eternal life, but also for our daily lives. It's a guide for everyday living read it and apply its wisdom. I would compare it to the book of Proverbs, which addresses daily life, while Ecclesiastes takes a broader view, focusing on the essence of human existence and everyday matters. In our previous video, we discussed the first and second chapters. If you haven't seen it yet, I recommend subscribing to our channel so you don't miss our future videos. Key themes in this section include the frequently repeated word time 318, 11, 17, and several recurring phrases like I have seen, I have also seen 310, 1641, I know 312, 14, and I said in my heart 317, 18. These phrases define the character of this section, as the author asserts that God has appointed a time for everything on earth, even for injustices 316, 17, and oppression 413. All of this is part of his eternal plan, which nothing can be added to or taken from. 314, and remains incomprehensible to man 311, rendering all human labor meaningless 39. There is a time to weep and a time to laugh. Join us as we explore these profound insights from Ecclesiastes and uncover how they apply to our daily lives. This word is clarified by the gospel saying, spoken by the Lord blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted Matthew 5, 4. Therefore, now is the time to weep and the time to laugh is given in hope because present sorrow will become the mother of expected joy, and who will not spend their whole life in tears and grief, if only they come to understand themselves and realize what they had and what they lost, in what state their nature was originally, and in what state it is now. Death did not exist then, disease did not appear mine and yours, these cunning notions had no place in life at the beginning. For just as the sun was common, and the air was common, and above all, God's grace and God's blessing were common, so the right to partake in every good was equally available to all. The affliction of covetousness was unknown, there was no hatred of those who had less towards those who had more, for there was no more or less. Beyond this, countless qualities, which no one can express in words, far exceeded what has been described equality with angels, boldness before God, contemplation of transcendent blessings, and the ability for us to be adorned with the inexpressible beauty of blessed nature, showing in ourselves the divine image, shining with the beauty of the soul, Instead of this, a deceitful swarm of sufferings, an evil nest of sorrows, has appeared in us. What will one name as the first of the earthly evils? All are equally significant, each anticipating the other in the preeminence of evils, all becoming a cause for similar tears. What will one mourn more than this wretched life? For what should one lament more about human nature? For its modesty or its many labors? For the fact that life begins in tears and ends in tears? For the pitiable infancy? for the lack of wisdom in old age, for the inconsistency of youth, for the burden of labor in mature age, for the weight of marriage, for the loneliness of a celibate life, for childlessness which leaves no root behind, for the fact that wealth incites envy while poverty is torturous. I remain silent about the multitude of various kinds of illnesses, the loss of limbs, the injuries, the festering wounds, the loss of function in the senses, the derangement of the mind by demons, and all the sufferings that nature encompasses and to which each person is subject by nature. And this frenzy of passionate love, this foul mire in which this maddening passion whirls, I pass over I do not speak of the unpleasantness associated with food due to regurgitation, so as not to give the impression that by this word I entirely disgrace life, presenting our nature as some kind of producer of pus. Leaving all this and similar things aside, I will say that for those who are sensitive, what is most worthy of tears is well known to all, Namely, that after passing this shadowy life, we are awaited by a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries Hebrews 10.27. Therefore, who will not spend their whole life in tears if they think about this and similar things? So now let it be a time to reflect on this. For the result of the sorrows of this present life, as is natural, will be that we do not sin in it. And when we succeed in this, the promised grace of joy will be granted to us in hope and hope, as the Apostle says, does not disappoint Romans 5.5. 5. What Ecclesiastes adds is almost a repetition of what was previously said. For having spoken about the timely nature of weeping and laughter, he added a time to mourn and a time to dance Ecclesiastes 
and this is nothing other than an intensification of both of the mentioned states. The sensitive and heartfelt weeping in Scripture is called lamentation. Likewise, rejoicing signifies an intensification of joy, as we learn from the Gospel, where it is said we played the flute for you, and you did not dance we mourned to you, and you did not weep Luke 7.32. History also tells us that the Israelites wept during the passing of Moses, and that David, when carrying the ark from the house of Obed-Edom, danced in a manner beyond the ordinary. For it is said that he sang joyful songs, played on musical instruments, danced rhythmically, and expressed his inner disposition through measured bodily movements to Samuel 6, 14, 16. Therefore, since man is dual, consisting of soul and body, and accordingly life in every action occurring within us is also dual, it would be excellent for those who weep in the bodily life, if they have many reasons for lamenting this life, to prepare for the soul a fitting rejoicing. For the more life is overshadowed by sorrow, the more reasons accumulate for the soul to rejoice. Abstinence looks gloomy humility cast down the eyes enduring injury is a cause for tears the pretext for weeping is not being equal to those who possess. But whoever exalts himself will be humbled Luke 14 11. The one struggling with poverty will be crowned, covered with sores, and showing in all things a life worthy of tears, will rest in the bosom of the patriarch, or may we also be through the mercy of Jesus Christ, who saves us. Since we attribute different meanings to weeping, we should also perceive laughter in the same way for weeping and laughter have more than one significance. Thus there is laughter that is blameworthy and laughter that is praiseworthy. And since laughter is divided into two categories worthy of condemnation and praise it is necessary for weeping to be likewise, so that there may be a corresponding weeping for praiseworthy laughter, and vice versa for laughter deserving of reproach. Often, life laughs, having abandoned itself to pleasure more than to love of God, for laughter is idolized. Just as one considers his belly as his God and another his purse, so too does someone, a lover of entertainment, constant wit, and the like, erect temples to laughter, worshipping it to such an extent that he offers it sacrificial worship. Indeed, he who provides what nourishes and induces laughter serves it. Of course, he deserves condemnation. Blessed is the one who rejects this laughter and surrenders to its opposite, weeping bitterly, acquiring which the diligent one said, Every night I flood my bed with tears I drench my couch with my weeping Psalm 6-7. But there is also praiseworthy laughter, for it is said he will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy Job 8-21, evidently without reproach. It is equivalent to the fruit of the Spirit. Joy for the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace Galatians 5-22. Therefore laughter that holds the same value as joy is praiseworthy. We should condemn weeping, the opposite of this laughter, and the emotional state that opposes the joy of the Holy Spirit. It was precisely this weeping that Jerusalem had, and it did not help. But why did this happen? Because this city did not repent at the right time, but when it was already too late. And now we understand what this leads to let life be called stern, befitting God-fearing people weeping, while life given over to pleasure more than love of God is called laughter. Those who weep in this life will later enjoy laughter, as they will also find blessedness blessed are you who weep now, Luke 6, 21. But those who indulged in laughter here, seeking pleasures more than they loved God, will weep when they receive punishment. For concerning such it is said, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. As for those who weep here with repentant tears, they pray to God like this, you have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure, Psalm 85. Now we will read and analyze the third chapter in this video. To everything there is a season, a, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. So we may go through some interesting excerpts, but overall, it's important to understand that time is given, and if, for example, God has allotted you time for a certain task, and you don't use that time, you won't get it back because we say everything is for God. Maybe, 
but there is indeed a real time. In the 16th chapter of Ezekiel, God describes Israel as a girl. He is the bridegroom, and Israel is his bride. Just as Christ explained, there is a phrase, it was a time for love. So, the girl grows up at 18, 19, 20 years old. She is at her most beautiful. This is the time when she can get married best, when she is in full bloom. There is today's strawberry, and there are two days it has been sitting. There is a week, it is still a strawberry. Someone might still buy it, but the buyer won't be the same as before. Similarly, with the girl, it's time to get married. Boys propose left and right. And she thinks it will always be like that. But then suddenly no one is proposing anymore. And then suddenly no one is even considering it. That is, you missed your time. Similarly, a guy has his time to get married. But he doesn't, thinking he's immortal. And then he's 35 and there are no takers. For example, there's a time to be born and a time to die. It's clear that God has determined for each person when they are to be born, when they are to die. You won't die sooner, neither war nor coronavirus will take you away, nothing, because there is a time and everything there is a time, there is a plan. For example, there's destiny for everything. So on the one hand, they say, is there fate or destiny on the other hand? The Bible is such a book that whatever interpretation you find, you'll find a basis in the Bible. On one hand, there is destiny, there is a predetermined plan on the other hand. We see how God changed destinies. He says, I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not set your heart to it. That is, God had a good intention, they did not listen, and God changed his intentions, and now everything will be the opposite, for those who are doing well and for those who are not. God raises up and brings down, and this is evident. So a person needs to understand God. Well, if a person, for example, is in a wheelchair and hears us and says that a better time will come for her, but this better time may just not understand that she will get out of the wheelchair. God can simply change your attitude towards the wheelchair so that you can endure it calmly because there are people who, for example, were born disabled, died disabled, were born with cerebral palsy, died with cerebral palsy, died with cerebral palsy. Well, tell him that a better time will come in terms of health. You're just deceiving the person. In general, yes, there are always exceptions. Exceptions prove the rule in general. A time to uproot what is planted and a time to plant what did Solomon mean? Planting trees. A time to kill and a time to heal. In the light of the New Testament, a time to kill probably isn't relevant. In those days when Ecclesiastes was written, it worked. A time to weep and a time to laugh, what does it mean to weep? A time to laugh? People don't understand when it's time for what. Paul says weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice because sorrow comes to everyone. If you are a reasonable and sensible person, then you should understand that you need to share sorrow with people. Well, sometimes a person is crying and someone else is rejoicing over it. Sometimes someone feels good and someone else is dying of envy. The Lord says in the New Testament to enter into the spirit of that person as they weep, to feel their burden, and it should be heavy for you too. When things are good, and you share in their joy well, you probably need to have love for that person to be able to rejoice and weep together. If you don't love the person, you will do the opposite. In our days in Christianity, the expression of joy in the form of dancing is called charismata people danced as a manifestation of joy. There are different dances. For example, if a blind person becomes able to see, and he jumps for joy, dances to praise God, I think in the New Testament, this is a natural reaction. If a person is so joyful that they don't know what to do with their body and want to jump, it is understandable. Or dancing. Like the Jews always did men with men leading dances, they are emotional people from the Middle East. Are you tired? Give this video a like. And we move on and read Solomon's instruction. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. What do you think is the time to refrain from embracing? Well, there is a time to embrace. As my wife says, during the day you have to work, and at night you embrace each other. And not the opposite when it's time to work, but the man wants to embrace. In reality, there is a time to embrace, and there is a time to refrain. For example, when a woman is at work, and there are men who like to embrace all the women, there are times when you shouldn't embrace. There is also a time to search and a time to lose It's interesting. A time to search when you have found and a time to lose. 
It's hard in life to always find and never lose still. We all find and lose. Well, unfortunately, we would like to always find, but sometimes we lose. When we find, we say thank God. When we lose, we need to have the strength to also thank God. A time to be silent and a time to speak this is also an important thing, to have the intuition to know when to speak and when to be silent. We must have this intuition. You talk, 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 and you feel that you have overdone it and need to stop talking. If a person does not have this intuition, it's a problem others have to tell them to stop. Or there is a moment when you need to speak and you remain silent because you show a false modesty and God says that there is a time for everything. There is a time to be silent. And there is a time to speak when God wants you to speak. And this intuition from God tells you when to speak and when to be silent so as not to confuse things. A time to love and a time to hate, it does not always work out to love. Yes, because God would probably want us to always love, but sometimes a person loves and sometimes they hate. If we consider it in this sense, a time for war and a time for peace. For example, in Ukraine and Israel, there is war, which means now is the time for war for Ukraine and Israel. Earlier there was peace and other countries were at war, now God has allowed war in Ukraine and Israel. If you agree with Solomon, Give this video a like. Let's continue reading what gain has the worker from his toil. I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. It's pointless to question God. God leads you along a certain path, such as your life, and no wise person can explain it to you, and you may not always hear it through prophecy. As you brothers say, and as Solomon says, just accept it as it is. And Solomon says that if you eat and drink because you work and see the benefit of what you do, for if you work, 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 and don't see the meaning in it, then the Lord says that is bad. If you work and don't see why are you working, there's no joy in life. But when you work, eat, and rejoice, God says that is. A gift from God to see the benefit of your life and your work. You do something, build something, and look at it, it's good. As God says, he labored and said it was good. If you cook a meal and it's good, it means you must find some joy in what you do. If you do things mechanically and don't find joy in them, it's not good. If you take pleasure in what you do, that's a gift from God people who work diligently until the end. Let's read further in the Proverbs of Solomon, verses 14 to 15. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. What is has already been and what will be has been before and God will call the past to account. The past, this is why people will revere him. God does all this so that people will revere him. What does reverence mean? It means feeling insignificant in comparison to God, feeling helpless. When you see all this, how God leads your life, you come to the conclusion that you understand nothing and influence nothing. As the philosopher Socrates said, I know that I know nothing. That's true, and the longer you live, the more you realize there are things without answers. You just have to agree that this is how God wanted it. The wisest thing for a person to do is simply not to argue with God and not to complain about life, just accept it as it is and thank God for the circumstances that have come about. Just surrender to God's mercy. You know, God, this is what life is like. I won't argue with you. What is has already been and what will be has been before. God says this is not new. It has already happened in past ages. What does this mean? Humanity follows a certain path. You are not the first and you will not be the last. This has already happened before nothing in this world changes. God shows that you are not the first and not the last. This has already happened before and people in the past were even better. God wants to show His glory. Read further verse 16. I have also seen under the sun in the place where there should be justice, there is wickedness in the place where there should be righteousness, there is iniquity. And I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. This passage we are reading highlights a common question people have, why does God allow this? Why is there wickedness where there should be justice? Why is there iniquity where there should be righteousness? We will read more in Ecclesiastes, where it says, 
I have seen that what befalls the wicked often befalls the righteous, and what should be the lot of the righteous often benefits the wicked, and I could not understand this. Why does God allow this injustice, this lawlessness? God allows sin because He has given everything over to human free will. God has given humans a choice, and humans either commit lawlessness or uphold righteousness. Where there should be righteousness, it is absent because the people whom God relied on failed to deliver it. He speaks of Jerusalem, saying He expected justice there but found lawlessness instead. Why will God judge the righteous? Judging means that the righteous will come before God's judgment along with the wicked. Does this mean that the righteous are guilty before God? Or does it mean that they will participate in the judgment where both the righteous and the wicked will be judged? The context of these words suggests that the righteous will also be judged, their deeds presented before God. Let's read further in the Proverbs of Solomon I said in my heart concerning the sons of men. God tests them that they may see that they themselves are beasts. For what happens to the sons of men and what happens to beasts is the same as one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. This means that humans and animals share the same fate. They both die, they both breathe the same air, and humans have no superiority over animals in this regard, because everything is vanity. Everything returns to the dust from which it was made. Who knows if the human spirit rises upward, and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. I believe these are very philosophical words, suggesting there is no difference between animals and humans. What did Solomon mean by this? One could be tempted by these words from a physical perspective. From a physical standpoint, God created both humans and animals from dust when humans die, they turn to dust, just as animals do. But this does not mean that God equates animals with humans because humans are made in the image of God and given reason, which animals lack. The book of Ecclesiastes is such that one can stumble if trying to understand it under the wrong light. Yes, we will become dust, but we are a higher creation of God, while animals are not. Whether the human spirit ascends and the spirit of animals descends is an interesting question. It is written that God breathed the breath of life into Adam, and he became a living soul. Animals also live by this principle, if their breath of life is taken away, they die. There is still a spirit that animates their bodies. However, this spirit probably will not be judged by God because it was not given the knowledge of good and evil as humans were. Animals do have a spirit, and Solomon wonders where this spirit goes. Does the human spirit ascend while the animal spirit descends? Is there a difference? Humans are unique in that God breathed his breath into them, making them living souls with the capacity for knowledge, morality, and a relationship with God. Animals, while also given life by God, do not have this same spiritual essence or moral capacity. Solomon's words encourage us to reflect on the mystery of life, death, and the spirit, highlighting our need to trust in God's wisdom and sovereignty. Let's continue reading Solomon's Proverbs. So I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work, because that is their lot. For who can bring them to see what will happen after them? In essence, Solomon continues to share his reflections with us. After each contemplation, Solomon's wisdom shines through as he concludes that certain things are beyond human understanding. This signature of Solomon is evident almost everywhere. There are things that no one can understand. Solomon suggests that it is best not to trouble oneself with such complex matters or try to become overly wise. It's impossible to explain everything God simply says to live your 70 years and find enjoyment in life, and then everything will become clear. I also think the word soul has specific contexts. For example, when Adam became a living soul, he became a living person. Depending on what God meant by the word soul, it can have different meanings. For instance, in prophecies, I have often heard the phrase soul, repent meaning the soul as a person. The soul is also considered the life in the blood. The Lord said that the life or soul is in the blood not in the sense of a soul that comes to judgment, because animals also have blood and life in their blood. Solomon's reflections indicate that despite the complexities and uncertainties of life, one should focus on the present and find joy in their daily activities. There is an acknowledgement of human limitations in understanding divine plans and the mysteries of existence. Therefore, Solomon advises accepting life as it is, finding satisfaction in one's work, and trusting that ultimate understanding will come in due time. This perspective encourages a balance between practical living and spiritual contemplation, 
recognizing that some aspects of life are meant to remain mysteries until the end. But this cannot be equated with the soul that will come before God's judgment, because a person has an inner man, while a dog does not have an inner man. It simply has blood that sustains life, and this ability to sustain life is sometimes referred to by God as the soul. Thus, if you eat blood, you are consuming either life or someone's soul. In what sense is this word used? The term soul is very important because it appears in many contexts. Let's continue reading Ecclesiastes 4.1.3. Again I looked and saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter power was on the side of their oppressors, and they have no comforter. And I declared that the dead, who had already died, are happier than the living, the who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. Solomon often speaks of complex matters, and although there are people who, under certain circumstances, can understand him, his words can be challenging. Solomon states that the dead are better off than the living. The Apostle Paul also said something similar, expressing his desire to be taken from this earth to be with the Lord, for he was frequently beaten and had a strong faith in God's kingdom. Solomon goes even further, saying that it is better for those who have never been born, because they have not seen the evil in this world. Solomon's statement that the dead are better off than the living reflects the profound suffering and injustice he observed. He acknowledges that life can bring such immense difficulties that death might seem like a relief. This perspective is sometimes shared by those enduring severe hardship, and Paul echoed a similar sentiment due to the constant persecution he faced, strengthened by his unwavering faith in the kingdom of God. Solomon's observation that those who have never been born are better off highlights the extent of suffering and oppression in the world. It underscores the harsh realities faced by some individuals, where life's burdens seem unbearable. While Solomon's words are not meant to encompass all of life, including its joyous moments, they provide a poignant commentary on the plight of the oppressed and the harshness of earthly existence. It's important to recognize that people may experience such intense struggles that they believe death would be a reprieve. However, some people fall into despair even amidst blessings and peace, often due to allowing negative, demonic thoughts to convince them of their misery. These individuals may remain in perpetual sorrow, failing to find joy, despite having no visible reasons for such deep despair. This suggests that a person's inner state and how they handle life's challenges are crucial to their overall well-being. Indeed, it's not necessarily because God predestined a valley of tears, but rather because people have a rebellious and complaining spirit, constantly grumbling without reason, that they create such a life for themselves. Let's continue reading Ecclesiastes 4.4, and I saw that all toil and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. This verse highlights the pervasive nature of envy and competition among people. There are always individuals who excel more in singing, have better houses, drive nicer cars, or succeed more in various aspects of life. Those who are less successful often look at those who are more successful with envy. Everyone strives for success, and I often say that we all seek the success we desire. However, those who lack success often envy those who have it. Why do bad relationships develop with people who are more successful than us? Sometimes, people can't even explain this to themselves. There might have been normal relationships between two people until one started to have an advantage over the other, and then the relationship deteriorated. People often don't understand why they feel envy. They might think, I'm not envious, but why did the relationship spoil? who whispered in their ear to love this person less. Envy began to raise its head, leading to pride, which then affects relationships. In situations where there is success, we must always examine our hearts. Where there is someone's success, there are two problems either you are among the successful or among those who are lagging behind. Both groups need to be vigilant. The successful need to guard against pride, and those who are less successful need to guard against envy. In any endeavor, Envy is the culprit, not the state or external circumstances. Human sin, human flaws, and human vices are to blame. Solomon's wisdom here addresses a fundamental aspect of human nature. He observes that much of human effort and accomplishment is driven by a desire to outdo others, which he deems as ultimately futile and meaningless. This insight invites us to reflect on our motivations and the true sources of our satisfaction. Are we striving for personal growth and fulfillment or are we simply trying to surpass others? True contentment comes from within and from a recognition of our own efforts and achievements rather than from comparison with others. 
Vice is when someone has more, but the more they have, the more worries and anxieties they face. For example, when you look at someone who has more, you might say, I don't want that. Thank you, Lord, for what I have. Meanwhile, someone foolishly sits idle, consuming themselves with their own concerns. It's better to have a handful with peace than a handful with trouble and spiritual torment. So why does the fifth verse fit here? The foolish one who sits idle and consumes themselves, what does that have to do with success? Well, the fifth verse ties into the fourth. Take the scenario of two individuals, one who dedicates themselves to learning and mastering a skill, while the other remains idle. While one works diligently, the other merely philosophizes. Eventually, the hard worker achieves success, purchasing a car and building a house. Meanwhile, the idle one continues to idle, but then begins to boast about their spiritual enlightenment, condemning the hard worker for their material success. In reality, the idler only idles because they lack initiative. God grants everyone a choice. If you prefer idleness, then idle away, but don't complain about it. Don't judge those who chose to work and achieve success. They're just as spiritual as you are. Indeed, from lack comes self-destruction because there's nothing to consume. And there's nothing because those who didn't sow won't reap. Therefore, these words hold true. If you want to have something, strive for it, learn, work for it. Pursue something, and you'll attain it. Ecclesiastes 4, 5, 6. People say, The fool folds his hands and ruins himself, perhaps that is true. But I say it is better to be content with what little you have than to always long for more and end up with nothing. The just Lord knows human life. He knows what comes from not getting enough sleep for the last 10 years. And God asks, Is it worth it? Maybe you've tasted less, but live more peacefully. Sleep with your spouse and enjoy a modest income. It's everyone's choice a golden mean. God gives the choice if you want less, you have it, and live peacefully. If you have more, it's more stressful. If you have even more, you sleep with a gun under your pillow. So what did you choose? Ecclesiastes 4, 7, 12. Again, I observed the futility under the sun one person without a companion, without a child or a sibling, yet toiling endlessly, finds no satisfaction. He asks himself, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure this too, is meaningless and a miserable task. There is another scenario, the accumulation of wealth by a solitary individual. He lacks a family, relatives, or loved ones. He amasses more wealth than he needs, yet continues to labor day after day, denying himself simple joys of life. He never stops to ponder, for whom do I labor and deprive myself of enjoyment as Charles Bridges comments? The miser for such he deserves to be called is the miserable slave of mammon, toiling hard, scraping up his pittance the miser is unhappy. What a foolish and empty way of life. Solomon thought. God asks, for whom are you working so hard, because for whom do you exert yourself? For instance, there's a group of people who seem to effortlessly generate wealth money flows into their pockets, whether through their own business or not. They're the ones who have live money and who would willingly refuse it as it flows in. But then there are those who work tirelessly, even sacrificing sleep, alongside those who have 10 children. God asks, why do you work so hard when you don't have the expenses he suggests? Work for three hours, that's enough for you, but let him work 10, because he has 10 children. Essentially, God wonders why someone would strive for big earnings when they don't have the expenses. God says, why do you need it? It's better for two than for one, because they have a good reward for their labor. These verses are often read at weddings. What do you think Solomon meant at weddings? Because these verses are often read, mentioning the threefold cord that is quickly broken, interpreted as the union of husband, wife, and Christ between them. It's a tough psychological task. In real life, it's easier for a woman to survive without a man, as it's true that following a man means dealing with scattered shoes, runny noses everywhere, and other things. You need a cleaner for the guy, but not for the woman. But there's another part that shows just how helpful it is to have someone else in the house. There's someone to talk to, even if a woman is financially secure, has a good pension, it's still somewhat burdensome to be alone, it's tough. Solomon says that two are better than one. Ecclesiastes 4, 13, 16. A poor but wise youth is better than an old and foolish king who no longer pays attention to warnings. For the youth may have come from prison to the kingship, or he may have been born in poverty within his kingdom. I observed that there was no end to all the people who were subject to such a king. 
yet those who come later will not be pleased with the successor. This too is futile, and it's like chasing the wind. Foolishness and the vanity of life aren't exclusive to the common people, they also apply to kings residing in palaces. Solomon describes a king who overcame poverty and imprisonment on his way to the throne, but now, in his old age, he became unbearable. He refused to heed the advice of his counselors. It would be better if the palace were ruled by a young, trainable man, even if he were poor. Solomon was thinking of the entire populace, subjects of this king, and of the young man, the successor, evidently. The crowd rebelled. They grew tired of the old ruler and wanted change, hoping for better governance. But even those who come after them won't be pleased with the king they choose. The fickleness of the crowd, its desire for change, helps Solomon understand that even the highest honors of the world are vanity. They can also be considered a weariness of the spirit. The foolishness of a king and his folly lies in his inability to take advice. A wise person can take advice they become wise because they listen to one, then another, and another digesting it all in their mind, drawing conclusions from what people say, and becoming better. A person who refuses to listen to anyone is doomed because they cannot develop they cannot learn from others, as they know everything themselves. This self-limitation makes life burdensome. Even young children sometimes advise their parents, and in their words, there is reason they need to learn. Ultimately, whether you are wise or foolish, it doesn't matter you will die, and other people will be born into their own epoch. Later, when we are buried, whether you were wise or foolish, no one will care. By nature, a person is religious, but that's not necessarily good. It can even be bad. This religiosity can prevent someone from feeling the need for salvation as an undeserved gift of God's grace. Furthermore, a person's own religion can be merely external and ostentatious, lacking internal substance. Vanity can infiltrate religious life, just as it can any other area, perhaps even more easily. Therefore, in chapter 5, Solomon gives some advice to help guard against formalism and superficial faith in one's relationship with the Creator. Ecclesiastes 4.17 advises people to pay attention to their steps when they go to the house of God. This may involve respect for God in general, but it's more about the ability to learn rather than engage in empty talk. Rash vows are the sacrifice of fools. Foolish people make them without considering the harm. When you go to the house of God, be more prepared to listen than to offer sacrifices. They don't think that they're doing wrong. That is, there are people who can hear, there are people who have brought gifts to God. And God says that if a person has brought gifts to God but doesn't hear what God says, then they're doing wrong. Why is it more important to hear the word of God than to offer gifts? You put money in the box today, but you didn't hear what God was saying, and God says that the one who put money in the box is lesser than the one who heard the word of God. So what good are your sacrifices if God can't change you? God didn't come for money, he came for our souls. Money has its place, but the soul comes first. In this video, we delve into the concepts of wisdom and folly in life exploring their presence both among common people and kings. Drawing from the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible, Solomon discusses the distinctions between a wise young person and an old, foolish ruler. He emphasizes the importance of heeding advice and being open to learning in order to grow wiser. Additionally, the significance of internal religiosity over external forms of worship is discussed, urging attention to the Word of God as more important than sacrificial offerings. This video prompts us to reflect on our actions and how we engage with wisdom and spirituality in our lives. And for the soul to change, you need to listen to the Word of God more often. And of course, subscribe to our channel.